We're going to take a look at Jonah chapter 4 in just a minute here. Been talking this past month about times when in the Bible when people were angry with God and how that how that went over, what they did and how God responded to them. We're going to look at just another one today. Jonah chapter 4. Some of you are familiar with the story of Jonah. He goes to the city of Nineveh and he preaches to it and he says, Nineveh is going to be overthrown in, in a short time and, and everybody repents and, and puts on sackcloth and ashes and, and, uh, and this is where we pick up here. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, Is this not what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city, There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I am angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? So last time we talked about Moses talked about how Moses got frustrated with God. Moses got frustrated with God because God told him to go and to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And God says, and he will let the people go. And Moses was really discouraged and frustrated because Pharaoh made it even worse. He didn't let the people go. He made it even harder for the people. And so Moses was upset because, uh, Lord, what you told me to do didn't really seem to work like like you said. So God was acting in confusing ways. God seemed, seemed to have not done what he said. But Jonah is angry when God did do what he said. When God does as He normally does, and when God's ways and what God says actually do fit with His character. God did exactly what Jonah anticipated here. And Jonah's mad at God because of what he knew God would do and what God actually did. This is a little different situation now. Verse 1, Jonah was extremely angry. He wasn't just a little angry. He was really mad. He was very upset. It says he was greatly displeased and became angry. Either one of those would have been enough for for telling us how upset he was. But if you put both of those together, that means that's just emphasizing it all the more. He was really mad. And Jonah even admits that he's angry in verse 9. I'm angry enough to die, he says. That's how angry he was. And Jonah's anger at God, I think we can easily say, is sinful. 
This is not a righteous anger. This is not a good anger. This is an anger that is sinful, that is not godly. It's based in pride. It's based in selfishness. And it's based in just plain stubbornness. He can't be, he can't accept this turn of events. And instead of trying to adapt to it or try to see things God's way, he's just staying right where he is. He's not budging. He's digging his heels in. And he's just refusing to change. I'm, I'm going to be mad and I'm, I'm going to stay mad. Jonah isn't angry with God. He's angry at God. Made this distinction last time. Righteous anger sometimes gets frustrated with God because God isn't acting as fast as we would like. And so we sometimes get frustrated with God. You know, how long, Lord? How much longer are bad things going to happen? And so we get angry with God. But it's not, but we're actually upset alongside of God at the same things he's upset about. He's not exactly happy that there's evil and injustice in the world and terrible things that happen. God's not happy about that, but he has his timeline. And so sometimes we get frustrated. God, I hate this stuff. You hate this stuff. How much longer? But that's not the case here. Jonah's angry at God. Not with God. At God. His anger is not in line with where God is or who He is. So this, this, is, pretty, this is pretty serious. This is sinful anger. I can't accept your ways, God. I can't accept who you are. I can't accept what you do. Who you are makes me angry. This is unacceptable. Jonah is angry because God was merciful. Of all the things to be upset with God about, to be angry that God is merciful, that, that, that's, that's, that's unique. That's a new one, isn't it? If you, if you look at the story of Jonah, and I have you read the other three chapters of his story in your Bible readings this week, this guy might have been the most successful prophet of all. If you look at how people responded to him, he had a better response. He was more effective in his preaching than anybody else, probably. Jeremiah, maybe the longest, one of the longest books of the whole Bible, only had a couple people listen to him his entire life. Elijah, he had fire come down from heaven. And the people just still didn't change. Jonah, he says five words. Five words. And a whole city turns around. Now, we don't, we don't judge success by worldly standards, by just numbers and stuff like that, but if you want to just look at the response that he got, Jonah was probably the most successful prophet of all. And instead of being like, yes, all right. Thank you, God. It's, God, how dare you? What's wrong with this guy? Jonah knew of God's mercy and didn't want Nineveh to have it. He didn't want Nineveh to receive God's mercy. Now, if you know some of the background, some of the history of what Nineveh is, what nation they are, that's the nation of Assyria. If you look back at the history of Assyria and how cruel they were, how they even bragged about their cruelty, they put it all up in their palaces, pictures of, of all of the heads of all that they chopped off so that they could just revel in how terrible that they were. These were awful people. These were awful people. These people make Hitler and Stalin look tame. Why would you want mercy for people like that? Some, some people are just so bad, they just need God's justice. They need the hammer to drop and have, have God's punishment be upon them for being so bad, right? 
And it's all, it's all it's bad enough to read about people being like that, but if you saw this, if this happened to you and to your family, to your people, it'd be a lot, little different, wouldn't it? Some of you are maybe familiar with ISIS and how cruel they can be and how they're not really shy about their cruelty either. They do it in public squares so that everybody would be afraid of them. It's pretty sick what they do. Imagine if that happened to your family. Imagine how you'd feel then. If you can imagine that, you might be able to put yourself in Jonah's place a little bit. These are awful people who have done awful things, terrible things, unspeakable things. And now God is going to for, just forgive them? He's just going to say, oh, okay, you're off the hook now. What? Jonah did not want mercy to come on these people because they were terrible people. And they were terrible people. And so it's very difficult for him. He's angry about this. And hopefully we can see a little bit why. But Jonah would rather die than live in a world where God gives grace to Nineveh. He would rather die than to have this be true. I can't accept this reality. But more than that, what he's saying effectively is that I can't live in a world where God is this way. I can't believe in a God who would do this. I can't serve a God who would do this. God, if you are going to pardon those Ninevites, then I don't want to be alive anymore. Uh, nothing makes sense anymore. I can't, I can't handle that. So Jonah, his anger, it's maybe understandable, but it is sinful. Because he's not rejecting Nineveh, he's rejecting God. He's saying, God, I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to be who you are to these people. So even in this sinful anger, let's look and see how God responds. Verse 4, But the Lord replied, Have you any right to be angry? Do you have a right to be angry? Even in sinful anger, God reaches out to Jonah. Jonah's anger is not godly. It's sinful. It's wrong. He's not angry at Nineveh. He's angry at God. It's one thing to be angry at terrible people who are doing terrible things, but it's another thing to be angry with God and to say, God, you're in the wrong here. I can't accept you doing this. And yet, God doesn't strike Jonah dead. A lightning bolt didn't just hit him and vaporize him instantly. God didn't turn away from him or forget about him and say, okay, Jonah, if you're going to be like that, then I'm, I'm going to go over here. And you can be over there and you can stew in your little anger and bitterness. You can have your pity party and all that. And I'm just, I'm going to leave you alone. See ya. God doesn't do that either. God deals with Jonah kind of like in the prodigal son story where there's that older brother who can't believe how terrible this younger brother has been and so he can't celebrate that the younger brother's home. He has to go and kind of stew by himself. And what's the, the father do? He goes and looks for this older brother to talk to him. Hey, something's not right here. What's going on? So, God asks Jonah a question. God's reaching out to him. Hey, let's, you have some anger here. Let's, let's deal with that. Do, do you have a right to be angry here? Now, now think about that. Do you have a right to be angry? So even when our anger is sinful, God will reach out to us. That, that's true for us too. Even when we are in the wrong we're angry for the wrong reasons, in the wrong way. God won't abandon us. He won't strike us dead. 
He'll reach out to us. He'll ask us things like, do you have a right to be angry? He'll give us things for us to think about. So, if you are angry, whether it's right anger or wrong anger, give it to God. Bring it to Him in prayer. Talk to Him about it. Be honest with with Him about it. If you have something on your heart, something on your mind, share it with Him. Put it before Him. See, See what He does with it. Always bring your anger to God. Be honest with Him. But then look at what Jonah does. Jonah doesn't answer God. Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. Jonah doesn't answer. So in anger, Jonah retreats from God. He goes away. doesn't answer God's question. It says Jonah departs. It didn't say he went somewhere. He departed. He kind of left the presence of the Lord. He went away. And where did he go? It says, it says to a place east of the city. Why would it mention that? In the Bible, there's kind of a pattern that's established where going east is kind of symbolic for going away from God. When Adam and Eve left the garden, they went east of the garden. And so there's an expression that maybe you've heard before, maybe not, but it's called east of Eden because we are east of Eden. We are east of perfection, the way it was supposed to be. And so we are living in sin now. Things are not working right. We are east of Eden. When Cain murders Abel, afterwards he moves east. When the Tower of Babel was built, it was built in the east. When the Israelites went into exile, they went into exile in the east. So being east is kind of symbolic here for going away from God, being away from God, separating from God. So Jonah retreats from God. He goes away from God. Not because he has to, he wants to. He doesn't want to be around God. God, I'm done with you. Talk to the hand. I'm through. I can't stand you anymore. So God's trying to reach out. And Jonah's like, no. So verses 6 through 8. And the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said it would be better for me to die than to live. So when Jonah doesn't answer, God gives him a lesson. God doesn't give up on Jonah, not even now. Jonah's going away from God. God could have said, all right, fine. You want to be that way? Be that way. Go to your room. Slam the door. Do what you got to do. Fine. I'll be out here when you're ready to grow up a little bit. God doesn't say that. God, God pursues them. So, all right, if you're going to be this way, you want to do this the hard way, then we're going to do it the hard way. I got a lesson for you. So God gives this plant that grows up over Jonah. It gives Jonah shade. And it says Jonah was very happy about this plant. He was very happy about it. And then, in one day, it dies. And the plant's gone. You notice that each time it says that God provided. I mean, it literally says that in the text. God ordained a plant to come up. God ordains a worm to chew this plant and eat it up. God ordains an east wind to make Jonah very hot. So God's setting all this up to give Jonah these experiences. Maybe, Jonah, maybe you'll learn this lesson now that I'm going to try to teach you something. And then he puts the question to him again. Do you have a right to be angry about the vine? Jonah was mad about the city and now he's mad about this vine. And Jonah's still 
very angry. And then God explains the lesson. Okay, you were really attached to this vine, weren't you? Here's kind of the lesson that God's trying to say. You were attached to this vine because it provided you shade and you, you were really happy about it, weren't you? But you didn't make it grow. You didn't plant it or anything like that. It just appeared. It sprang up in a day. And you only had it for a day. And then it was gone. And you were all sad about that. This is a plant. You love this plant. You were attached to it. You only had it for a day. Then it was gone. This is a plant. I've got 120,000 people who don't know up from down, right from left even. People. A little more valuable than plants. People who I've known their entire lives, not just for a day, but their entire lives. You're going to be upset about a plant, but I can't be upset about 120,000 people. You see the difference here? Jonah's problem was hidden idolatry. That's what his problem was. Jonah wasn't just disappointed that something happened that he didn't want to happen, that Nineveh was pardoned. His life was over. This is how you know you have idols in your heart. If there's something in your life that you wouldn't just be disappointed about, that you just wouldn't be sad about, but your life would be over, you have an idol. If there's something that you cannot live without, you have an idol. You have something that you love more than God. Now, I'm not saying it's bad to be sad about something or to be disappointed. No, that's, that's perfectly valid. But if your life is over because of something happening, something you lost, you have an idol. You have an idol in your heart. This is what happened with Jonah here. He wasn't just disappointed. His whole life was over. I want to die. Look at the screen. Let's answer this together. What is idolatry? Idolatry is having or inventing something in which one trusts in place of or alongside of the only true God who has revealed Himself in His Word. And we have this tendency to do this. John Calvin says that the human heart is an idol factory. We will make idols. We find other things to be attached to instead of God. And we'll live by those things instead of God's ways. This is in our nature. And so it's probably safe to say that all of us have some hidden idol in our hearts right now where there is something that we are a little too attached to. Maybe a little more attached to than we are to God. Something's a little too important to us. There's something in our, our life, in our heart, that we couldn't live without. Something that if we lost, we might turn on God, like Jonah. Idolatry is the most dangerous condition known to man. This is the most dangerous condition known to man. We think cancer is bad, this is worse. You've heard about Ebola, idolatry is worse. You've heard about AIDS, you'd be better off with AIDS than to have idolatry. Heart disease kills more people than anything else. From what I read, idolatry is worse, more dangerous. This is a silent killer, especially the hidden ones. Because when we love something more than the Lord, when we turn from the most important thing in life, in our life, when we turn away from the source of everything that's good and we worship the good stuff rather than the one who gave it, the one who gives and sustains life itself, we're not just giving up on this life. We're, we have eternal consequences now. Idolatry is to cut ourselves off from everything good. 
We get attached to what the gifts are. Instead of the giver, we're cutting ourselves off from the source of everything good. That is scary. When we have an appendicitis, what happens? We have surgery right now. We need emergency surgery to fix this. Because this is lethal, right? If, if we have a heart attack, what, what do we do? Call 911 now. In fact, you're supposed to call 911 before you do anything else. When we have idols in our hearts, what should we expect God to do? As bad as an appendicitis or a heart attack would be, if idolatry is worse, what do we expect God to do? It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? How to be angry with God? Be prepared to let go. Be prepared to let go. There's things that we're attached to, that we're maybe a little too attached to. And there might be a time when we might lose that thing, whatever that is. Not saying it will happen, but we might. And when we do, how will we handle God? We need to let go of our idols. We need to let them go. We need to be able to let them go. If we love something more than God, why wouldn't God take the most drastic measures to get our hearts right with Him again? If this is the most dangerous thing to us, why wouldn't God do whatever is necessary to get us back? We need to be able to let go of pride. Jonah had pride here. He had pride in himself. I deserve God's grace. I deserve God's mercy. But not those people. I mean, it's not as if Jonah is a perfect man that he doesn't need God's grace. I deserve God's grace. I'm a good person. Those people, they're terrible. They don't deserve God's grace. We need to be able to let go of our pride. Sometimes our pride can be an idol. We need to let go of our rights. This is kind of un-American, where we're used to claiming our rights. The right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and all that. We get pretty upset when people start to threaten our rights. We get pretty angry. We get pretty defensive, don't we? People start threatening those things or challenging us on that. But what if we're more attached to those things than we are to God himself? What if God changes our life in such a way that some of those rights get taken away? Maybe to try to get us back. Hey, your heart needs to be fully devoted to me. You're a little too attached to these things. Jonah was in the wrong and he needed to be corrected. God needed to do emergency surgery on his heart. And so he gave him this experience. All right, we are in desperate situation here. Jonah, I'm going to do this. I'm doing this to save you here. Because this is bad. Jonah was in the wrong and he needed to be corrected. Maybe, just maybe, when we're angry with God, maybe we need to be corrected too. Now there are terrible things that happen and not because of necessarily we've done anything wrong. The Bible has examples of those things. But sometimes we get angry with God because we're wrong. Because we're sinful and we need to be fixed. And when we are angry with God in those circumstances, at that, those times, we need to be ready to let go. We need to be ready to change. Be ready to accept who God is. And even accept a God who would take away something that's very important to us. Jonah's lesson was painful. So God ordained that plant that he was really happy with and then God takes it away. And then on top of that, God pours this hot east wind right on him. God's lessons aren't exactly enjoyable, are they? Fixing our sin is always painful. Sin is painful. 
and fixing it is painful. But God is not beyond giving us painful lessons if it brings us back. God will do anything to get His people back. Anything. And so when we talk about the fear of God, this is kind of what I think of. God will do anything to get us back. He who did not even spare his own son will do anything to get us back. Jesus faced the pain of the cross to get us back. And the father had to lose his son to get us back. This is how far God will go to fix us, to get us back. There's been times when I've talked to people and I've heard them say that I think God is punishing me. Now, I don't want to say that God never punishes people for anything. I mean, sometimes God does, but if you are a believer, then Jesus already took your punishment. There's no need for punishment anymore. God doesn't punish you. If you're a child of God, if you belong to Jesus Christ, then God, God's through with punishment. He corrects us. He doesn't punish us. He fixes us. He heals us. And sometimes that's painful. Sometimes that hurts. But it's for our good. It's not about punishment. God's not vindictive. He's not like us. He's not bitter and angry like that. God fixes us. He's our Father. And He's going to do what it takes to make our hearts right with Him. And our anger and pain are small prices to pay to be with Him. Small prices. As hard as that might be to imagine. We've been angry with our earthly fathers even when we were wrong. Right? Right? If you think back to growing up, I mean, we all had parents and they, we were sometimes wrong and we were just sometimes stubborn and, and uh, they, they were, they took something away from us perhaps. Maybe they, maybe we were grounded and maybe we were really angry about that, even though we were wrong. But weren't they right in still grounding us? Weren't they still right in taking that away? So, we are going to get angry at our Heavenly Father even when we're wrong too. Those times will probably come. And when they do, be ready to let go. Be ready to change. Be ready to look at your life differently. Be ready to look at God a little differently. But don't run away from God like Jonah did. Because of Christ... Our Heavenly Father doesn't smite us for our anger. He prunes us of our idols. Idolatry is the most dangerous thing to us because it has eternal consequences. And God is going to do what it takes to prune us of those idols because He's our Father and He loves us. Hebrews 12.10 Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in His holiness. If you find yourself angry with God, go to God. Because as hard as it might be to believe, He actually does care about us. And He wants our hearts. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, we, we read that You love us. We know that You love us. And there are times, Lord, when there are some painful lessons that we need to learn. There are some painful things that we need to go through before we realize who you are and what you are about. Lord, when we go through those times, give us the presence of mind to remember who you are and that we can still trust you. And that, Lord, we need to bring this anger to you and not run away from you. Lord, remind us that you are our Father. 
and that you prune us of our idols. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.